And it's Ken Kreitzer for CBSI Services. We're over in Pearl River, New York today with a good friend, Tom Flood, who is the founder of Team Flood and has had a distinguished career uh, in credit cards and consumer uh, goods uh, as a background in, uh, in public accounting. Uh, Tom, good to see you today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ken. Pleasure. Um, uh, we met uh, through uh, the Marketing Idea Exchange and uh, uh, Peter Blau and uh, his team with that organization. But uh, you go back to, um, as I said, starting as, as an accountant. But you had, uh, we actually overlapped together at American Express in the early 80s. And you did a lot with a division. I was, I was supporting the Merchandise Sales uh, Division. And uh, you met some people there that are still leading the company uh, today. Tell us a little bit about your experience at American Express. Sure, Ken. I joined American Express in 1982, coming out of a uh, tenure with PwC in public accounting and, and General Mills. I managed a number of their divisions. At American Express, I was recruited uh, to join Ken Chenault and a team of very prominent merchandising executives. The division was headed up by Bob Myers. And uh, I came on board in uh, 1982. And the notion was to see how rapidly we could grow that, grow that division. Uh, at the time, it was a $100 million division, which seems very substantial in direct marketing. It was actually my first foray into direct marketing. Uh, but $100 million at the time, and as Lou Gerstner told Ken and myself, uh, was very small. And he had to make a determination as to whether he wanted to continue that division. So... 12 to 18 months later, uh, this is probably mid to uh, late 1983, Ken and I presented to Lou, uh, presented to him our notion of how we could grow this business and grow it in a very rapid way uh, using some unique marketing concepts and leveraging media that already existed at American Express. So I'd be happy to go into all of that if you'd like, Ken. Uh, but uh, the interesting model um, that American Express had was, can we essentially very tastefully leverage the relationships that we already have with our card members and do it in a uh, high level of customer service, but do it in a very quality way in terms of serving up various products and services to the card members. So what we did as an organization uh, under Bob Myers, soon thereafter under Ken, was to put a merchandise team together that would serve up an array of very enticing products, high-profile products, very prominent brands, and products that you would expect would be offered by American Express. And we tastefully created uh, media that we served up to card members on a monthly basis, for the most part in the credit card statements that card members would receive. We periodically put out a, uh, a catalog or a co-op solo, which contains a number of, uh, of offers. And products such as, at the time, uh, VCRs, television, jewelry, furniture, uh, publishing products, you name it, but very upscale products, and the demand for these products was extraordinarily high because American Express, as we all know, uh, prides itself on its card members and the credit worthiness of card members. And we would offer these products in a payment plan to be paid over a period of time from 12 to 36, in some cases 60 months. We managed the credit risk very effectively and the business grew in a relatively short period of time, three to five years, to almost $1 billion. It was incredible growth. Um, the business actually was so successful that some of the senior executives, the CEOs of many of the prominent retailers in the United States actually came forward uh, to the then CEO of American Express, Jim Robinson, and expressed their concern that American Express was competing with them. So American Express made the decision um, by the late 80s to begin uh, winding down this business unit, which was a billion dollars at the time. It continued it for a number of years, but 
soon thereafter, in the early to mid-90s, actually closed the business unit. So it was a great experience for me uh, at American Express. Met some tremendous people, people that I still have a close relationship, including Ken Chenault, Jim Cracciola, and others. Well, certainly American Express that era, when I was there, uh, uh, Jim Robinson was the CEO, and uh, uh, it, Amex was known as a leading data processing organization. They, were, they, had, they brought in the first data resources organization at one point, and uh, they really were uh, the leaders in the premium card business back in the late 70s, early 80s. What were some of your memories uh, of the things that, they, that really stood out from that period? Well, at the time, uh, American Express uh, was, was entering an industry uh, in terms of direct marketing where information became very, very important. In direct marketing, as you may recall, Ken, it was comprised primarily of modest-sized companies, companies from $5 million, uh, to $75 million, uh, constituted most of the successful companies in the industry. There were some emerging larger players like L.L. Bean and Spiegel at the time, but there were very few large companies that were successful. The banks, American Express in particular, you mentioned ADR, that was the back end of American Express. Began, it began to be very effective for the business units within these large companies, American Express in this instance, to compile data, enable much more effective targeting uh, based on that data, based on the profile of individuals who would respond um, not only their prior behavior in terms of responding to offers, but the information gathered from their spending history on the card. We knew the types of products. Uh, we knew if, in fact, they were individuals that uh, had an inclination to purchase products on a direct basis. So American Express was at the forefront in terms of utiliza utilizing information effer effectively, assuring that there was approval and an opt-in by card members to receive offers, and then to very judiciously send out various offers to card members based on their profile and their prior behavior. Absolutely. Well, also, uh, I moved on and worked at Dean Witter, which was affiliated with Sears uh, at the time, and uh, they were still a big power in uh, both retail and online catalog, but uh, but that, but that changed. What have been some of the other elements of the card business that you've seen change? Similarly, it was the era in the bank card business of consolidation and then the entrance of online banking in, in recent years. What have been some of the changes uh, that you've seen uh, um, really over the last couple of decades implementing some big technology changes to the field? As you mentioned, Ken, there have been a number of changes that have occurred over the last two to three decades. I would say one of the first was the uh, going from mass to much more targeting and card products or financial service products that, co that were compartmentalized to various consumer segments. One of the first uh, initiatives in this area was affinity marketing, where a bank a financial institution, American Express, would partner with another successful brand. It could be an airline, a hotel, a retailer, where you would have the financial institution issuing a card uh, to consumers of a very successful consumer brand, uh, such as an airline, an American Airlines, United Airlines, Hilton, Hyatt, and so forth. And we would be offering this card to selective members uh, of various uh, affinity groups within that, uh, within that retailer or that airline or that hotel. Uh, that became extremely prevalent uh, and extraordinarily successful for both the issuer American Express, uh, Visa and MasterCard, and the issuing banks in their networks do this uh, very extensively right now. And 
the growth that we've seen in the last 20 to 30 years uh, from cash to checking to credit and debit has been extraordinary. Um, and this was the first foray into it all, all of the affinity marketing that took place. More recently, what has occurred is that there are new media that has emerged. Um, and the new media uh, manifests itself in, in digital capability. Um, the jury, I would say, is still out in terms of the overall uh, effectiveness and growth of digital. Uh, many uh, thought at the issuance of the iPhone, iPay uh, capability that um, was launched three or four years ago, that the plastic would essentially become obsolete in time. Essentially, the conclusion is not so fast. Uh, consumers today are comfortable with the plastic and for most of the research and the surveys that you see, they're questioning the, the benefit, really, of replacing the plastic with the phone. And the value proposition is still to be determined uh, in terms of whether the digital will uh, take a significant share away uh, from the plastic. The one company that we all know that's been successful uh, with the digital app is uh, Starbucks and I've heard numbers of upwards of 25% of all transactions of Starbucks uh, take place via the phone. But that is the single exception. I don't think there are anybody, anybody else that has a uh, transaction level north of 5% on digital uh, other than Starbucks. So we are seeing a change. Uh, we are seeing other technologies that will have an impact. And most of the financial organizations are beginning to try to determine how do they play in this area. We're all familiar with PayPal. We, many of us use an app called Venmo. Venmo is an app that enables an individual to transfer cash from his or her bank account or some other source via an app to another individual almost instantaneously. The question, and they have significant market share Venmo has. Uh, the number of users with a Venmo app, I've heard estimates of north of 100 million, uh, which is extraordinary. The question is, how will this be monetized? So you're seeing all of the major banks uh, making a determination how they're going to play. They are concerned that a non, in this case, a Venmo under PayPal could preempt uh, them and take share away uh, because of the voice that they have in the consumer's mind in terms of movement of cash. So a Venmo, P to, it's called a P2P app, could become uh, have a significant effect on card companies and card companies are going to want to play and I think you're going to see some major launches of P2P apps across the board this year. Okay and uh, you've been very successful on your own as uh, with your own consulting practice now uh, over 20 years uh, and uh, working on helping new, find new distribution channels for customers generating customer loyalty and programs some publishing uh, you had a nice project for the Met Art Museum. and uh, But I, I know you, you mentioned uh, that one of your key skills is just identifying talent for your clients and uh, capabilities to, that they may want to consider. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, your consulting practice. Yeah, my consulting practice, Ken, which you mentioned, began in 1994 after I left uh, Avon Products. Uh, fortunately, through the years and my relationships, uh, with companies such as American Express and General Mills and Avon enabled me to very quickly establish a, a, a client suite 
that uh, resulted in my being busy almost 100% of the time. So when you, in my case, uh, I left Avon, uh, the CEO who recruited me, uh, had a falling out with the chairman, and I left the company uh, with him. And many people, uh, as you know, who leave uh, a job like that will go into the consulting business uh, temporarily as they look for opportunities. Uh, I quickly came to the conclusion that consulting uh, and advising senior executives of companies was something very much suited for me. I really enjoyed it. Um, and in addition to, become, to being very busy uh, based on my relationships, I, I did uh, was successful in bringing on uh, a number of major clients and, and helped them in, in various ways. Uh, where I am most fulfilled and where I, what I consume most of my time in these days, and I've really, it's, this has evolved, but it, it's really been the case for the last 10 or 15 years. Consulting is really the second half of my career. Um, is being asked by a Ken Chenault or a Jim Cratchiole or other CEOs to look at the company from the outside in. What are the new emerging trends? What are the technologies? What are the companies? What are the skills? Who are the people that should be on our radar, uh, that we should be talking to, that we should consider having a relationship with? Perhaps that we should consider buying the company. So I am always out in the marketplace looking at various people, looking at technologies, looking at companies that could, in a significant way, enhance the business model of the client that I have. Uh, I find this very fulfilling. And what I, I invariably do, of all of the people of the companies that I meet, about one in 10, I will serve up to a Ken Chenault or a Jim Cracciola. And I provide a rationale on why I think there is value here, why they should be brought to the table. And based on that, a Ken or a Jim or whoever the executive is will make a determination whether they agree or not. And typically 50 to 60 percent of the time they do agree. And then we syndicate it through the organization, that idea. Absolutely. And uh, you've had uh, some work for a very important charity in the area. Uh, Family Promise for the Homeless uh, uh, in New Jersey. Tell us a little bit about that. Family Promise is a national organization. Uh, I am involved, I'm on the board of the New Jersey chapter of Family Promise. And Family Promise is an organization, it is the only organization that supports homeless working families uh, that are without a support system. And it, you know, people have a perception of the homeless situation, and it is uh, a cause that I personally have adopted. And what I am uh, most taken with is individuals who are really trying to escape this level of homelessness. And to give you an example of the profile of a family that is in this homeless condition, it is essentially either a single parent who's the head of ha household, or maybe two parents, and their aggregate income may be twenty to 30000 Before we will bring them into the network of Family Promise, they must either be working or have exhibited a capacity to work. And so what we do is we temporarily, while they may have lost their job, they don't have a personal support system, they do have two to three children typically, uh, young children under the age of 10. Um, but it, there is a crisis that we are managing very uh, in the near term. And that, so we provide the food, we provide the, uh, the shelter, and we uh, will educate them, so educate them to, to enable them to begin the process of escaping homelessness. But what we do in terms of a differentiation and where we are evolving to is taking the homeless parent and not only giving them the soft skills to be successful in the workplace in terms of you know how to speak how to interview how to write uh, and be effective to get 
an entry level or a modestly compensated job, but we want to bring them to the next level. So we are taking these individuals and assigning a mentor to them that will work with this homeless adult and help them be educated in the skills they're going to require for them to get to the next level. It could be um, as simple as helping them be effective in technology. It could be as simple as helping them more effectively speak so they can present themselves effectively when they go for a job interview. But um, But our model is one where the homeless situation, and this is only a segment of the homeless, we understand it, but it, it can only be overcome by these individuals being trained and educated to escape the level of, uh, you know, minimal con- compensation. You know, we believe that it might be beneficial to raise the minimum income. It will help some of these people. But until they can themselves be more fulfilled, more confident, and be skilled enough to get into a company and, ri- and rise once they're there, that's the only level of success. And we need a person to work with them over time. And many people have stepped up and are willing to help. And what's the uh, website uh, for that organization uh, for those who'd like to uh, learn more about it? That's familypromise.org, F-A-M-I-L-Y-P-R-O-M-I-S-E dot org. Um, And it it is a national organization, and we are the New Jersey chapter. Very important work. Uh, You're also got a chance to work together on the Marketing Idea Exchange with Peter Blau and the team uh, uh, developing the program, and uh, got a meeting coming up uh, next week, actually. Tell us a little bit about uh, Marketing Idea Exchange, how you got involved. Yeah, I've been involved, Ken, with the Marketing Idea Exchange, which is the sequel to the Direct Marketing Idea Exchange, which was founded uh, 40 years or so ago by Nat Ross uh, of NYU. And I've been in the organization uh, for all of these years. You may recall the DMIX was essentially for individuals in direct marketing. It was almost a rite of passage. It was where you uh, intermingled with some of the most successful people in the industry. You learned a great deal. um, And you really wanted to be associated with this organization uh, to learn on a sustained basis and most importantly, meet the most successful leaders in the industry. Uh, And... About seven or eight years ago, uh, Peter Blau, uh, Chet Danzel, and myself saw that many of the uh, long-term legacy members of the organization were retiring. They were moving away. Unfortunately, uh, some of them have passed away. And we said to ourselves, we wanted to sustain this organization. And we've worked with... uh, put together an enhanced board, and thank you, Ken, for uh, agreeing to be part of that board. And we're we're bringing a number of very successful professionals uh, in the industry to to help us to be effective board members, but with a goal of beginning again to attract either to speak or to become members now of an organization that we're positioning to be much broader than the DMIX, which was essentially, you know, strictly direct marketing. To a large extent, I think we know that almost everything today, in one extent or another, is is direct. So we're assuming that direct uh, uh, will be, you know, incorporated into our charter, but we feel that we do not need to utilize the word direct. We want it to be much broader, and we want to attract the top people in marketing, in the industry today, in the most prominent co- companies, to really want to be part of this organization and to address us. Uh, so we in the past, uh, over the last 10 years or so, have been able to attract some very prominent people 
to speak to us. Ken Chenault of American Express spoke, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, some of the top executives and writers of the New York Times have spoken with us. Um, IBM Watson just last year uh, addressed us. So we will be reaching out to people who were at the top at a level of excellence where they want to uh, be part of this organization too. We're also looking for education uh, and to ally ourselves more heavily with the prominent institutions in the New York area. Uh, NYU is an organization that from, from the heritage of this direct marketing idea exchange was a key company, Nat Ross, the founder, uh, actually uh, lectured at NYU. NYU is an organization that some of the uh, current board members uh, and uh, individuals associated with us put together the master's program at NYU about 15 years ago. So NYU is a company we want to bring back into the fold, and Columbia is another organization, uh, another institution, amongst many of the other prominent institutions. I mean, we're very fortunate uh, that Pace University uh, has become essentially the charter educational institution of MIX, uh, and we will continue that. Thanks. Very good, and uh, really enjoyed our chat today with Tom Flood, who is the founder of Team Flood. Uh, uh, which uh, has uh, a broad uh, range of marketing uh, clients, and Tom's got a extraordinary background in accounting, in the card business, and uh, a number a number of fields. Uh, great to talk with you today. Yeah, thank you, Ken. I enjoyed it. Very pleased to be with you. Thank you, uh, uh, Tom Flood, and uh, this is Ken Kratzer talking business for CBSI Services today in Pearl River, New York.